This continues the series of videos I'm making on the Odes of John Keats, based on the book of the same name by Helen Venler. I'm trying to make each so that they can stand alone, but I would recommend watching the others to get a fuller picture. All the views I describe in these videos are Venler's, except where I note otherwise. This video is about the Ode on Melancholy, which Venler considers the fifth and penultimate poem in the series of six odes, all of which John Keats wrote in the year 1819, just two years before his death from tuberculosis at age 25. Throughout the series of odes, the poet's conception of life and art matures until it reaches full ripeness in the final, magnificent Ode to Autumn. The present ode pushes the poet's previous grudging acceptance of impermanence or process into an active quest. He is willing, even eager, to experience all, from the peaks of beauty and joy to the depths of sadness or melancholy. I'll read the poem before describing Venler's analysis of it. For, for this, each stanza has its own slide. Here it is. No, no, go not to Lethe, neither twist wolf's bane, tight-rooted for its poisonous wine, nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by nightshade, ruby grape of proserpine. Make not your rosary of yew berries, nor let the beetle, nor the death moth be your mournful psyche, nor the downy owl a partner in your sorrow's mysteries. For shade to shade will come too drowsily, and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. But when the melancholy fit shall fall, sudden from heaven, like a weeping cloud, that fosters the droop-headed flowers all, and hides the green hill in an April shroud, then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose, or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave, or on the wealth of globed peonies, or if thy mistress some rich anger shows, imprison her soft hand, and let her rave, and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die, and joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu, and aching pleasure nigh, turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. Ay, in the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine, though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. His soul shall taste the sadness of her might, and be among her cloudy trophies hung. The Odes of Keats are a gradual progression toward integrating beauty and truth, as announced in those famous lines of the Ode on a Grecian Urn, which immediately preceded this one. Beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. In the Ode to a Nightingale, Keats wished to avoid the true woes of life and had conceived of art as pure beauty, a stream of lovely sound in which one could lose oneself and so forget the world's sorrows. But in the Ode on a Grecian Urn, he progressed beyond this view, acknowledging the roles of both truth and beauty in art, which he conceived of using the visual metaphor of a carved marble urn. Through this exploration of the urn, each scene on it frozen yet strangely dynamic, his focus continually flipping between content and medium, through this he came to implicitly accept process, the fact that all things change, die, and must always come with their opposites. That beauty, to speak truthfully, is a beauty that must die. In the present Ode on Melancholy, this implicit acceptance becomes explicit, and more than mere passive acceptance. The poet of this ode takes an active approach to life, including its miseries. At first, as we'll see, somewhat frantic, but finally more temperate and equilibrated. I referred to the ode to a nightingale's focus on hearing, and the ode on a Grecian urn's focus on sight. Venla says that it is almost as though the odes were invented as a series of controlled experiments in the suppression or permission of sense experience. 
the ode on melancholy at last admits the lower senses of touch and taste. This is, in other words, the poem of the strenuous tongue. More on this in a moment. First, let's look at the overall shape of the poem. It has a thesis, antithesis, synthesis structure. That is, it first proposes one thing, then its opposite, and finally that which harmonizes the two. Here is how Wendler expresses it. She says that this is a poem of desperate action and equally desperate reaction of thesis and antithesis, followed by a third stanza which finds a synthesis both unexpected and satisfying. The first stanza proposes suicidal numbing, or at least strongly suggests it, even though ostensibly dedicated to advising against it, due to all the attention it lavishes on the symbols and potential means of death. Interestingly, at least two of the means of death, the poisonous plants wolfbane and nightshade, can also be pain-relieving narcotics if taken at low enough doses. The advice of the stanza is not simply, don't kill yourself because of sorrow, but don't numb yourself. And yet the stanza can hardly stop dwelling on morbid phenomena, the beetle and the owl being traditional symbols of death, and the death moth perhaps referring to the death's head moth, which looks like it has a human skull on its back, though Wendler doesn't mention this in the book. Lethe is the mythological river of forgetting, whose waters are drunk after death, Proserpine, the goddess of the underworld. All these symbols make the stanza the stanza of the mythological, albeit with a strong undercurrent of the natural. Here we already have the sense of taste, the ruby grape and wine, and touch, the twisting of the wolfsbane, kissing of the forehead, the rosary, the downy owl. The stanza ends, For shade to shade will come too drowsily, and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. Which means, and I got this insight from the link at the bottom of this slide, rather than from Wendler, this means that, the shade or darkness of oblivion will overtake the shade, the numbed or half-dead soul. The inhabitants of the ancient Greek underworld were referred to as shades because they were all but shadows of their former living selves. The second stanza runs in the other direction, frantically toward life, toward forcibly seizing or devouring as much beauty as one can. This stanza leaves the mythological trappings of the first behind and lavishes attention on nature directly. The weeping cloud, droop-headed flowers, green hill, morning rose, salt sand wave, and globed peonies. Here we have more of the sense of touch in the imprisoning of the mistress' soft hand, and more of taste in the command to glut in the salt sand wave, and, somewhat uncomfortably, in the feeding on the mistress' eyes. We are to feed ourselves to excess on beautiful things. But this advice betrays a reactive desperation. There is a sense in which the poet commands plunging so vigorously into life, precisely because he feels the lure of numbness in death. In the third stanza we have the temperate resolution. The active acknowledgement that all beauty is a beauty that must die, that melancholy lies hidden within and is essential to all delight, that life and death are inextricable. I'll talk in more depth about what exactly this resolution is shortly. For now, I'll just note that this is the stanza of allegory. What I tried to explain more directly just now is expressed more beautifully in allegory. A in the very temple of delight, Veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine. We also have the allegorical figures of joy, whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu, and of pleasure, pictured as the nectar of a flower turning to poison at the very, in the very process of the bee drinking it. And, of course, we have that grand allegorical image of him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. In this we find concentrated both the senses of touch and taste, the pressure of the tongue, and the subsequent explosion of flavour. The constitutive trope of the poem is admonition or exhortation. The poet warns not to do this and encourages to do that. He warns us not to numb or kill ourselves in the first stanza, then encourages us in the second to feed on beauty instead. 
In the last stanza, the language shifts towards third-person description as the temperate resolution is found. Here the recommendation is less direct, though still present. Be like the one who can deeply savour the normal joys of life, fully knowing they pass away and lead to sorrow. Of course, all this is only ostensibly addressed to the reader. Really, it is addressed to the poet himself, who needs this admonition or exhortation because tempted to death or excess. Just a note here on the second stanza. So far I've described what I understand to be Venla's interpretation, that it exhorts us to plunge ourselves into the pleasures of beauty to counteract encroaching sorrow. But there is an ambiguity in the language. Glut thy sorrow could mean feed yourself with beauty to alleviate your sorrow, or feed your very sorrow itself, increase or intensify it. This approach, while still frantic, would lead more smoothly into the final stanza where sorrow is affirmed as necessary. And it seems that the objects we are advised to focus on are particularly impermanent. A morning rose, a wave, a woman's beauty. It could be that this is an exercise in intensifying rather than alleviating one's sorrow, either because the poem is, after all, a quest to find the melancholy, or because the intensified sorrow is to be experienced aesthetically and so isn't simply sorrow. I do think that Venner's interpretation is more likely, though, or at least the predominant sense of the stanza. But it may be that Keats's already achieved insight of the third stanza subtly conditioned his presentation of the second, in the ambiguous phrase, glut thy sorrow, and in the examples chosen for this. At some point, Keats planned for this poem to have four stanzas, with a stanza full of fantastical imagery introducing the hero's quest, prefacing the rest. This is generally considered to be his original intention, although Venda points out in a footnote following the critic Stillinger that the earliest copy of the poem has only three stanzas. This would mean the cancelled first stanza was an afterthought that was considered and then subsequently discarded. In any case... Here it is. Though you should build a bark of dead men's bones, and rear a phantom gibbet for a mast, stitch creeds together for a sail, with groans to fill it out, blood stained and aghast. Although your rudder be a dragon's tail, long severed, yet still hard with agony, your cordage vast uprootings from the skull of bold Medusa, certes you would fail to find the melancholy, whether she dreameth in any isle of Lethe Dal. And there she is, the melancholy, as depicted by William Blake in an illustration of Milton's poem, Il Penseroso. As the discarded first stanza suggests, the poem describes a quest to find melancholy, who is finally discovered within the very temple of delight. In the cancelled stanza, the hero sets out to seek her in the underworld. In the subsequent stanza, beginning with No, no, go not to leave thee, he alters his quest, but it remains a quest. Throughout the poem, the poet takes an active role toward art and life. He is no longer the passive spectator he had been in the previous poems. The action of bursting Joy's grape at the end is to be taken as a heroic action, albeit tinged with tragedy. The object of his quest, like many heroic quests, is female. Ultimately, she is melancholy, but provisionally she is the goddesses Proserpine and Psyche in the first actual stanza, and the human mistress in the second. Each stanza is composed as one long sentence, and in each, says Vandla, the syntax conducts a sustained request for its own resolution, as increment by increment it amasses itself to a conclusion. This is unlike the other odes, which often interrupt the syntactic momentum with an exclamation or question. We see this sustained quest for resolution in the enumeration of methods and symbols of death in the first stanza, culminating finally in the last two lines with the reason why one shouldn't pursue them. In the second stanza we see a similar pattern, an enumeration of different things to glut one's sorrow on, but something odd happens in the eighth line. The or of the immediately preceding line, 
ore on the wealth of globed peonies is actually very different to the ore in this line, or if, the, if thy mistress some rich anger shows. The preceding line is at the end of a list of things to glut on if a sudden melancholy fit should fall. The eighth line, after all this enumerative build-up, is a new scenario, but if, on the other hand, your mistress shows, shows some rich anger, do this other thing. This long build-up and quick compressed ending parallels the first stanza and produces a similar impression. It also serves to subordinate or conceal what is perhaps the real cause of all the poet's melancholy, the displeasure of his beloved. And likewise, in the third stanza, we get a build-up of allegorical images expressing or developing the same idea, and then a quick change in the last line. Although the poem is phrased as advice, Fender is clear that this should be read as the poet's advice to himself. This is a personal poem in impersonal guise, and should not be read as uniformly sage advice. In particular, the advice of the middle stanza is not to be taken to heart. In Wendler's words, So long as aesthetic relish is violently disconnected from human feeling, it is predatory and unreal, as Keats implies by his appending to the excesses of the second stanza, the equilibrium of the third. In the predatory mode, one lets one's mistress rave in anger, one rather listens to one neither listens to her words nor experiences one's own wrath or shame at her anger. Instead, one feeds irrationally on her peerless eyes. This deflection of emotion into visual relish is, in Keats' eyes, a form of perversion. The very choice of words for this may suggest this deeper view, to feed on eyes. So how does the final stanza resolve the rest of the poem? There are actually two resolutions. In the first resolution, the poet realizes he does not need to leave his earth. He does not need to leave his earthly mistress in order to find what she seeks. She is perhaps the cause of his sorrow, and in any case, he is tempted to replace her with the female figures of the first stanza, symbolic of death. Proserpine is the goddess of the underworld, and the psyche of this poem, unlike the psyche of Keats' earlier ode appears in her mournful aspect, grieving her abandonment by her lover Cupid. Then reads the lines, Nor let the beetle nor the death moth be your mournful psyche, as a figure for an internalized death wish, psyche being also, in addition to the goddess, a Greek word for soul or mind. The final stanza resolves this dilemma between death and mistress by surrounding the earthly mistress with the immortally mortal allegorical figures of beauty, joy, and pleasure, that is, the forms or essences of a beauty that ever dies, a joy that ever bids adieu, and a pleasure that ever turns to poison. There is thus a union here of the earthly and divine. But as the stanza progresses, we see there is a further resolution in which the poet does seem to find his divine death mistress after all. When he enters Melancholy's hidden shrine and bursts Joy's grape against his palate fine. This doesn't necessarily contradict the first resolution, but may be an intensification or deeper version of this. That is my view at least. I'm not completely sure whether it is Venla's. I say this because the implicit advice of the third stanza is to embrace joy and life, fully knowing that pain and death lie hidden within them. It does not counsel fleeing life or frantically glutting oneself on beauty to counter pain. The poet must dwell with his mistress, who dwells with ever transient beauty, joy and pleasure, while actively embracing this transience, in doing this, he will come to experience the deeper mysteries of existence, symbolized by entrance into Melancholy's shrine. This final stanza is Keats's attempt to adequately express a deep affirmation of process. Desolateness has featured in previous odes as something unnecessary and regrettable, but here it is affirmed in Wendler's words, Desolateness is no longer blamed on deceitful fancy or deceitful art or deceitful perception. It is seen not simply as a consequence of joy, not even as inextricably balanced against joy, 
but actually as a component within joy itself and indistinguishable from it, just as savoring is indistinguishable experientially from bursting. These are perhaps the dark clustered trees and branched thoughts new grown with pleasant pain hinted at in the Ode to Psyche, which, though mysterious, are more compelling than the familiar flowery fane the poet then builds in their midst. In the Ode on Melancholy, says Venla, Keats wishes to create a frieze in which change is not represented as temporally caused, but intrinsic. He is trying to represent platonic ideas that incorporate change and process. This attempt, though, has varying success. He describes the first of his mistress companions as beauty that must die. This replaces the way he expressed a similar thought in the Ode to a Nightingale when he was bewailing the woes of the human world where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes. Beauty that must die is not like this a prophecy that, alas, beauty will fade in time. But it rather expresses an intrinsic necessity that transients is part of beauty's very being. However, this is a prop proposition rather than an image, and thus it does not succeed fully poetically. Next we see Joy, whose hand is ever at his lips, bidding adieu. This is more successful because it is a clear image, like the prior proposition, it expresses that transience is intrinsic to joy, not some accident that befalls it from outside. However, Venla says this is a static pose. It doesn't fully capture the dynamism of process. Though we can picture this blowing of a kiss goodbye as a movement rather than merely a pose, Keats doesn't make this explicit. The next image of aching pleasure nigh turning to poison while the bee mouth sips, captures dynamism more effectively. However, Venus says it lacks in visual coherence. What causes the nectar of the flower to turn to poison? She says, In so far as women are flowers, and Keats the bee, he confusedly blames himself for distilling a ven venom from their sweetness and yet at the same time blames the nectar itself for its instability and lack of resistance to metamorphosis. Next we have the image of Melancholy's shrine within the Temple of Delight. This takes a rather different representational approach. Here, says Venla, space, the distance from temple door to inner sanctum, substitutes for time, the time it takes the initiate, initiate to pass from simple delight to the more complex, intertwined delight in melancholy. In the final stanza, we can see the languages of thought and sensation jostle with each other in the attempt to f affirm the truth of process. Yet sensation seems to win out at the end, in the splendid and memorable image of the strenuous tongue bursting joy's grape against a fine palate, a dynamic sensual image that excellently expresses bidding adieu and winning in one single act. But this is not like the predatory feeding on eyes of the second stanza. Rather, the lines about Joy's grape represent the normal and equilibrated, if strenuous, experience of bursting of fruit into savour. Both the depressed fascination with symbols of death and the manic glutting on flowers and eyes have been left behind. But now look what happens right after this, in the final two lines of the poem. His soul shall taste the sadness of her might, and be among her cloudy trophies hung. The first line is in the active voice, his soul shall taste the sadness of her might, and so leads us to expect the second will be active also, but here it suddenly flips to passive, and be among her cloudy trophies hung. The active hero is now suddenly inert and acted upon, as Venla so beautifully puts it, the hero silently dies upon the bursting of the grape, and we realize that it is his heart that has broken in the tasting. The poet has become a votive offering, hung from the walls of Melancholy's shrine. He has become, in other words, disembodied into art, transubstantiated, allegorized through emotion into a spiritual trophy. Keats the man will die, 
but his poetry will live on, a poetry made possible by his willingness to taste all aspects of life. Within two years after this poem is written, Keats will be dead from tuberculosis, a death he saw his own brother suffer the previous year. Wendler remarks that this final image represents Keats' first full incorporation of his own certain death into the odes. The ode he wrote next, the Ode to Autumn, is the last in the series and perfects Keats' attempts to express beauty truthfully and truth beautifully. In this magnificent final ode, he will achieve what eluded him in the Ode to Mel on Melancholy, the use of aesthetically ordered sensation as a way of thinking and of presenting truth. <laughs>